And when John and I arrived at the Albert Hall, we were, you know how it is, you walk around that building looking for the right door. And some woman came up to us and said to John, uh, you look like a musician. Are you, are you playing here? You know, there was, I think Eric Clapton was there that night. And John said, no, no, we're not, not, not tonight, not playing. And she said to John, oh, well, never mind, stick at it, and one day you might get to play here. And John, being John, just smiled and said, yeah, you, know, you never know. Well, I was a great friend of, of John and his missus, um, and we used to uh, spend a little time playing a bit of sort of music together of all different sorts in our local pub. I got involved with the Sunflower Jam in the first place through uh, Ian Pace, or should I say Ian's wife, uh, Jackie, um, who, um, as everybody who knows and loves Jackie to bits, uh, it doesn't sort of come as a suggestion, it's more of a sort of... Um, command really. The first concert was in 2006 and that came about um, we, we went to um, UCLH hospital there's a little boy there who had leukemia he was 13 his name was Kevin and he was a huge deep purple fan and I had a friend phone me up who was a healer that worked at UCLH and she said he's he's really needs a lift he's got to have a bone marrow transplant and so I arranged for John and Ian and Vicky and I and we went there and surprised him um, which was incredible and then I saw the amazing work that the healers were doing there with children with cancer thought how can we raise some money and get more healers there but also to make it a fun night so hence uh, Sunflower Jam 2006 and we had Robert Plant, Paul Weller, Ian and John and most incredible night. In 2009, we moved to the Royal Albert Hall. Everyone said, don't do it, Jackie, don't. This is too big a leap. But I felt we could do it, and we did do it. Yeah, the Sunflower Jam has become part of my life, and I think part of everybody who's involved in life, and I don't think it will ever be any different, unless Jackie sacks us. With this one, exactly kind of the right amount of, t of time has elapsed um, between the last Sunflower Jam and this, and John passing away and this. That distance allows tonight to be, you know, the celebration stroke, the remembrance. I mean, I'm sure there's gonna be tears. I'm, I'm absolutely sure there are. Now is the time in front of the audience and everything tonight to absolutely celebrate all the various aspects of John's career. And that's how I see this evening. I absolutely see this as a sort of celebration of, of what he was. I love rock when it has orchestral backing and, and John moved between um, his work with Deep Purple, which was sort of, you know, w without orchestra. And then he, of course, wrote a lot of classical music, some of which I have and which is wonderful. Um, so it's going to be a mixture tonight of all the styles. And the Sunflower Jam has always been the one which is just a load of fun. And it's a load of fun out there, and it's a load of fun back here. Hey, Set up day, get the band in and uh, talk through the charts. The conductor's coming in, this is, this is the one day the conductor can be here. Walk through the things, lots of bar counting for the orchestral stuff, and then run some of the songs, just, just so we kind of get on the same page. But as you can see, there's a lot of sort of wiring and setting up there. I mean, it's huge with a, with a big orchestra and, and the sort of logistical side of it is huge. And from a musical side of things, it's just trying to nail down the variables, who's going to sing with what, what key things are in, things change key-wise, you know, people doing them in different keys now, so trying to get everybody on the same page musically. By the time we've done these two days, we'll be, we'll be up to speed and, and 
you know, some of the stuff is, is songs that have an orchestra with it, and that's much simpler. You just play the song. Mm. Some of the stuff is a kind of orchestral piece with band parts. We started about a year ago working with, with, with John's family, with his wife and his, his two daughters, and with uh, Jackie and with Ian Pace and Rick Wakeman and a number of other people. And we, we sifted through all the music, all the possibilities that we could think of. And basically what I wanted to do was to try to make every aspect of John's music come to life in different ways in the show. So we've got the stuff where he wrote for symphony orchestra and band together. We've got some of the songs that he wrote in other bands when he was in the Pace Ashton Lord, when he was in the other eras of Deep Purple. We've got some of his symphonic music, some of his classical, purely classical music. And we decided early on not to do the concerto for group and orchestra because it's been done a lot. We did it in the Albert Hall, we did the huge tour, we recorded it in the studio just a few years ago, the last recording that John did. So we felt that's been done and we could concentrate on other things. It's not written, but it might be quite nice if we all, instead of you just sitting it out, it would be nice to have everybody together. When he died, I sort of started to try to organize the music in some way to make editions of the music, to tidy it up and prepare it for publication. And actually, so since he left us, it's been with me almost all the time anyway. I've been sitting in my room in front of a computer for months now, orchestrating, preparing orchestral parts, editing John's scores, and that transition between what is a very internal process to becoming something that uh, is, is, is out there, that's a very exciting thing to see happening. John is very much uh, present in, in all this. I feel very strongly that he's, uh, you know, the spirit is a very strong thing and this is just coming coming to life in a, in a great way for all of us, I think. Well, we do have a nucleus that uh, helped us out at all, all the, the official Sunflower Jams. And so, you know, they're, they're consummate musicians, they're friends, and it's all done through love, you know, no, nobody's picking up pennies for this, they're doing it because it's the right thing to do. So they're, they're all good guys and that, that camaraderie makes it fun. We're celebrating a rather great man who is really important to a lot of people in the world and doing it for the right reasons is what um, makes it work. There's amazing, like, poignant moments because, you know, the last time that we were doing these sort of songs was with John um, conducting, really. Like, he was the one in rehearsal saying, OK, now this, then, you know, you do this. There's a, song, a track called Bore, part of the Saraband suite. And the Sunflower Jam Before Last, which was John's last, um, last show, we played that, we played a version of it. And I was going by the notes that, that we wrote in that room, but John was there telling us what was happening next. So I was, it was, I was writing it with John standing there. And then the next time I bring the notes out, it's to do his, you know, his, his concert. You know, these, these incredible moments of, you know, goosebumps that come through. And the incredible closeness that you feel to John doing this is, is it's beautiful, actually. It's, it's, it's really kind of, uh, there's no words for it. I remember the last time that we were together, um, it was with Rick and John. 
and um, we, I think those guys, they composed a couple tracks for that night. Um, I think he was here actually in this room. And after we'd, after we'd finished playing together, it was a great vibe, it was a great buzz. And John said to me, we should get together and do an album with Rick, myself, and you. Would you like to play drums on it? And I was like, oh my God, that would be amazing. And we'd always talk about it. We'd all, you know, there'd always be this, okay, we're gonna get ready to do something. And then um, I know that he, he felt ill. And um, it's just those, one of those things. I suppose we'll, we'll do the album when we get to him. Okay. <laughs> so you suddenly realise that what John played, you know, without thinking, I've got to go. <laughs> Jam is the absolute word involved in this gig. It's, I mean, I've just spent 25 minutes upstairs trying to figure out how the hell we're going to fit everything on this stage with the orchestra and all the instruments and everything. And, you know, we've got amazing stage managers, amazing sound, amazing, everyone that works in the gig is incredible, but because it's because of the, the atmosphere of the gig, because it is a jam and because there's so many different people involved and so many moving parts, it becomes almost impossible to plan it like a normal gig. It is really, you know, like going into the biggest pub in the world, setting up your gear and playing and having a great time. That's it. That's, that's the kind of vibe of the whole show. Um, <laughs> so the Albert Hall. It's going to be poignant and there'll be emotional moments, but I hope there'll also be plenty of joyfulness, which is exactly what he would have wanted. I think he, he was, a, a, he was a, a sentimental person, an unashamedly sentimental person, but sentimental in the right way, not in a maudlin way, but just full of sentiment. And he would have loved that, but I wouldn't think he would want us to be dwelling on that. And the, the way we've tried to design the music for the concert is, is with that in mind. Um, so that uh, the first half of the concert, I tried to focus only on John as an individual with some of his purely symphonic music, some of the music he wrote combining band and orchestra and saraband, uh, some of his more recent songs, which tend to be very gentle and rather melancholic in style. And then the rock and roll starts after the interval, and we put all the all the rock stuff together, uh, and it'll be a little sort of potted history of uh, of John's career as a rock and roll keyboard pioneer. A couple of songs from the Artwoods, a lot of Deep Purple, of course, and uh, it'll just be it'll be such a joy. It'll be great. So it's you know. Yeah. Cut. Hey, Bruce. Oh. Oh. Darling. Are you yeah. Rock. Bruce and Glenn. For a bit of rock to finish the evening, which was great, really. I mean, unknown quantity because they'd never sung together and didn't know how it was going to work or who's going to sing what. And so we had to battle that out. And that was very cool. You sing one, I sing the other. Yeah. I'll sing the first and second one. And we can, let's figure out who's going to sing the high and the low. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because otherwise it's... I want you to, I want you to be completely comfortable. Ooh. Does the, the look, because tr transitioning from that up there back... Just come on, I'll Keep on moving. It's the first time I've ever sung with him tonight, so the only, the only problem we've got is that we, our voices are, are, are in a similar 
similar range. Um, so um, when we do du duetting on, on things, one of us has to take the, the top bit, one of us has to take the bottom bit. And, and certainly with, um, you know, you keep on moving. I mean, I mean I've never sung a song before today. Um, so I was like, Ugh, you know. <laughs> so he, he's obviously done it a lot. So he said, well, I'll take the bottom bit. And we'd be just, we're just figuring, swapping things around a bit just so it works. Uh, yeah. Do whatever you feel comfortable. If we just, so, so we do that bit, so it's a, You keep on moving, keep on moving. Bruce and I have the same tone, timber, tenor, we're both tenor. And I have actually a bit of an alto thing going on, on the real top end, on the full set up. So we decided that maybe Bruce should sing my part in You Keep On Moving, and I should sing David Coverdale's part, which is the lower, sort of a baritone. Sound. And you know, because Bruce and I are, you know, aren't frightened to sort of go out of the box, it was uh, interesting, you know. So, it's all, I, I've always loved singing with other singers. I'm not one to not want to do that. I've always enjoyed sharing the microphone, and uh, it's always good when things happen. Good spark, good energy. Bigger is better. You tend, to, you tend to go to the top one naturally. Yeah, yeah. unfortunately, yeah. It was just a question of making them both comfortable with singing together, because they never having done it before. And um, just letting them find their feet as to who was going to do what and whether they split up or whether they sing together. That's the last time you hear it sound that good. How do you think that's going to sound for orchestra? I've got no idea. <laughs> I'll tell you tomorrow uh, when we do rehearsals. Uh, I've never worked with an orchestra before, so mm -hmm. who knows? <laughs> So good morning. Um, I'm sure that you all know who John Lord was. Just in case you don't, John was the founding member of the rock band Deep Purple back in 68 with Richie Blackmore. And uh, he was one of the great rock and roll keyboard pioneers. Uh, John made a sound like nobody else. And uh, he also fell in love with orchestral music when he was very young and spent his whole life with the two kinds of music side by side. 
And in 69, I think the second year of Deep Purple, he always had an idea he wanted to write a piece for a rock band and symphony orchestra together. And he happened to mention this to the management of the band. And they took that as a cue to book the Albert Hall. Um, and John hadn't written a note. <laughs> and he had three months to write what became uh, a concerto for rock group and orchestra, which was done in 69 in the Albert Hall with the RPO and with Malcolm Arnold conducting. Paul and John have worked together on the concerto for group and orchestra that John wrote for Deep Purple and, and, and uh, orchestra um, since just before 1999 when it was performed at the Albert Hall for the second time. And um, since then they've done so much work together and they've, you know, they've scored a lot of music together and they've re-scored what John had already written that hadn't been scored before and you know, there's, there's an incredible connection there and there is an incredible amount of respect both ways to, between them. I grew up with Purple's music in the house and one of the first records I ever heard was the record of the concerto and I used to stand in front of the mirror in my grandma's front room and conduct the record. And then over time the piece got lost. The score and the parts all got lost and so it couldn't be played again until in 1999 somebody in Rotterdam, an amazing young composer, transcribed the record, wrote out the full score from the record, and that meant that we could play the piece again. And so in 1999, exactly 30 years to the day from the 69 performance, we played the piece. I got to, instead of conducting my grandma's front room, I got to conduct the piece in the Albert Hall with Deep Purple with the LSO this time. And that began a friendship with John that endured until he died. And the first thought that we had when he died was that we had to go to the Albert Hall because it's such a part of this history, of this story. And we have to find a way to celebrate every aspect of what he did. So the rock and roll keyboard pioneer, the classical composer, the man who put these two worlds together and got roundly attacked by music critics for doing so. And so I think from that point of view, what we've got is the most varied concert you could possibly imagine. All right. Thank you very much. Well, this orchestra was actually recommended to us by Rick Wakeman because we were looking for an orchestra that would be able to, to take this on and in the right spirit, you know, it, it, and, and we all thought it would be great to have a young orchestra. Well, John loved working with young people, in the, with students, and he, he was travelling all around, giving lectures and, you know, talking them through and working with them. I was really lucky. I studied in Glasgow for my undergrad and um, he did a project with us, with the orchestra there. So it was him. We did his, is it concerto for a band and orchestra? We did that with just like a local band and he was playing as well and it was absolutely amazing. So it's great to be able to do this, like, yeah, Brilliant. after having experienced that. It was amazing. We were looking at what orchestras to get. They were horrendously expensive. We just couldn't before that and then Rick Wakeman said I work with this amazing orchestra called the Orion Orchestra. And so we got in touch with Paul Mann and we listened to them and he said they're really good. And then there was all this haggling going over, can we afford an 83-piece orchestra? But John's music was written for an 83-piece orchestra. We were thinking, oh my god, it's still going to be really, really, it just cost so much money. But they were really good. We couldn't do John's music without it. Man, man, yeah, man, man. Uh, again, he's, I think because of his age, He's open to uh, bending the rules to make it work. You know, it's not about, it doesn't matter how you get there, as long as you get there. Yeah, it's, it's great having Paul back conducting again. A, because he's, he knows how to work an orchestra with a rock band, like, which is pretty difficult. Uh, it's not easy. The, the two worlds are miles apart. You know, one is a controlled uh, internal balance uh, sound with an orchestra. 
electronic music is, is all over the place, you know, with different volumes, different frequencies, and marrying one with the other is difficult. You know, you, re you really need great te technicians around, you need great equipment, and you have to understand that both sides have to compromise, just a little bit to make it work. You know, Deep Purple became so massive uh, and so sort of all persuasive in their sound and in the dynamic of everything they did that one almost forgets that even two years after Hush had hit the charts, John was writing classical music commissioned by the BBC. So you've got that, that flavour and that love of that style of music was spilling into the centre point of John's career almost from day one. And uh, you know, that's the thing, sitting in the auditorium this evening watching the rehearsals and seeing the, the big orchestra on stage with the rock band in front of it, kind of that's the picture that sort of sums that up. Um, and please, can we just do the ending? This is letter O, this is the hit, the offbeat hits. It's been great yep. seeing the way the orchestra's reacted o, to the please. bands and also the way the bands have reacted to the orchestra. I think, you know, the youthfulness and energy Two, coming off the three, orchestra has, has, has really impressed. We're having an absolutely marvellous time. Like having the bands here, we have to adapt to playing quite a lot because um, we're used to just playing with a conductor, like we're used to being kind of playing behind the beat, whereas with the band there, obviously you've got a drum kit going on, so you have to really be on the ball yeah, and kind of play in time. Something like that. <laughs> we're a bit, no, we were a bit late. Just always a little bit of adjustment because orchestras tend to play later than the beat. It's a kind of safety valve that orchestral musicians have. Um, so that sometimes from the audience point of view, it looks like they're playing bah, like that. Of course, a rock band goes bah, straight on the beat like that. Sometimes it's difficult to match the two. And with Deep Purple, we always had a little bit of time to just adjust to that. But um, I think it'll be great. And we've, you know, we've always with an orchestra and a drummer, follow the drummer, then everything's fine. It's always great when you can play this style of music, number one, but when you're playing it behind such a grand orchestra, and um, obviously playing it for someone that you really loved and you got to know, you know, the little time that I did spend with John was real special. Yeah, just one second since we stopped. Just one thing to say to the strings. In all this accompanying stuff, don't um, give up. The tendency, I think, is with all this sound to think that you can't be heard. Actually, the mics will pick you up and will be mixed out the front. So all the richness and character that you can bring to it really will, be, it will tell. Don't feel that, oh God, we're just, you know, it, it's no point. Actually, there really is. Just to make sure that we don't lose any character. Okay, from F, uh, Knight. Uh, you know, I, I think when we're on stage, the, you're just making sure you've got the, the things that you need, the elements you need loud enough to, to make sure that, you know, you have your cues and your, you know, your things to play, play against. So uh, and if you have too much, it can start getting a little, a little confusing. So, uh, but the, yeah, the, the orchestra is there and we can certainly hear them. So. My hardest thing is counting bars rests, because in, in, in Sarabad, I've got more bars rest than I think that I'm actually playing. So, and the trouble is you're counting up and you're going 97, 98, and then something disturbs you, you go, no, and then you go, oh, noise. Oh, where are, you know, that's, that's the killer. And then you're looking around desperately for, for a clue. Sorry, what is the noise? It's very <laughs> Thank you. D major chord, please. Men of Warsaw. One. Um, I will be eyes down and counting tonight. So, uh, Paul Weller is going to come and do a couple of songs that uh, the Artwoods did when John was in the Artwoods back in the 60s. It's all covered. You just have to do what is comfortable for you. Paul Weller has chosen two quite obscure tracks from John's first rock band, which was the Artwoods in the 60s. But instead of like, you know, oh, doing his own stuff, it's not great. And it's like fantastic, really, that he's that positive and pure about it.
John and I wrote this song, we wrote one, only one song together. We wrote, obviously, with Richie and David and Ian together. But John and I wrote this one song called This Time Around. And that's a big moment for me because when John and I wrote that, I was, I was a young, really young dude, you know, and, and I wrote his lyrics to his wonderful minor nine chords that were coming from somewhere else, you know. And when I look back at the lyrics I, I wrote 39 years ago or 38 years ago, very mature and as John was always a big brother to me, you know, and um, helped me through a difficult period of my life. And when I wasn't there for myself, he was there for me. So those things I remember, and that song will basically speak the way I feel. And it's a moment. I think every musician has moments, you know. That is one of my moments, and this is one of my moments. I've never sung with such a big orchestra before, so it was quite nerve-wracking. But but they lift you, and it was just fantastic. But you know, it was emotional. There was um, pictured within the song, pictured within. For me, that's the one that always just undoes me, really. Pictured so. within. For me, you know, it's just you know, it's a tearjerker, you know, really about John, and uh, it's just the most beautiful song, and you know. Uh, so, uh, and you've got the right guy singing it too. One, two, three. You know, in 1968, I met John through Keith Hartley when Keith Hartley formed his own band. And I remember we had a review of one of our records and the melody maker, and John said, oh, we played with him in Germany, they've got a great singer. Well, that was me and that was the first time that John had obviously taken notice of me. And uh, when he wrote Picture but then he said he wrote, wrote it with my voice and mind, you know. John was such a presence, on stage, off stage, personally, in, in the music industry. He was, he was a big, big presence and he was a beautiful man and he, he took love with him everywhere he went, and he was such a well-liked person. You couldn't be on a stage with him or in a room with him without being affected by him or connected to him in some way. So I think, you know, all the people that would be on stage would have played on stage with John at some point, um, and they'll, I'm sure, feel his presence there. I'm sure they will. Like, it's it's going to be crazy. Here be friends, here be heroes, and here be sunshine, here be friends. John was a true gentleman, and as I say in the programme, all the years I knew him, I never heard him say a bad word about anybody, which is very rare in general, but extremely rare in the music business, because we're all bitches, really, you know, backbiting bitches. You know, I mean, he was just such a big... He was just a big bear of a bloke, you know. And I mean, they had this huge shaggy white dog. And it was sometimes hard to tell the difference between John and the big shaggy white dog, you know, except John told better jokes. Um, and he was just this wonderful, warm, you know, guy with a very dry sense of humor and uh, just a big twinkle in his eye. And a great musician, great musician. It's emotional, he was a lovely guy. He was a giant musician and, you know, 
it's it's going to be an emotional evening, that's for sure. My sisters and my brothers. We were in Orlando when I first heard Pictured Within. I just cried my eyes out. It was so beautiful. I'd never known John write such great lyrics. Uh, John has written the lyrics for his family, you know, and I know who I'm singing about when I sing the lyrics. I'm singing about his father, his mother, his sisters and his brother. He, do, he said, don't sing brothers, because I only had one brother, you know. And, uh, and, and it's singing about Vicky, you know. You know, bright eye, hair, hair so golden. It's the first time I've heard John's music live since John passed, and um, it, it was it was an amazing sort of hour of my life yesterday, where I got incredibly sad, then incredibly happy, and then sort of had this amazing joyous moment of you know feeling really connected to John, and at the same time really missing him, but at the same time not missing him as much because he felt really close. So it's yeah, it's um. It's definitely going to be one of those shows where there'll be lots of laughter, lots of fun, and a few tears, for sure. I, I'm, I'm, in a strange way, quite a spiritual person, and I, I, I don't doubt that he's here in, in, in spirit. And I don't doubt that he's probably both flattered and probably maybe a little bit embarrassed by uh, the furor he's created with, with doing this. Um, and I think that's... Everybody feels that. I don't think there's any doubt about it. There was a strength and an elegance about him which I found really, uh, you know, really very, very uh, appealing, very attractive. Here be home, here be travelling, here be thunder, and here be blue. And the other thing that we had in common Sometimes was that, you know, towards the end of John's life, um, you know, I, I'm a cancer survivor. I've been through a cancer diagnosis in 2007. So John and I had a real big kind of cancer talk. Um, and uh, that was a really sort of bonding moment. It, it actually sort of really was. So he and I became, funnily enough, through the years, gradually over a period of time, we sort of gradually became closer and closer. And it was really during the last sort of probably three or four years of his life that I knew him the best. Lose and win. Pictured within. When I lost it, I just lost it. We had to sing, you know, but I really did. It was like somebody just turned on a tap and um, I lost him. Pictured within. Absolutely beautiful. That's it's, it's the same.
I think in many ways, you know, John's sound shaped the sound of Deep Purple. It's unusual for, for keyboards, organ particularly, to kind of really, really propel um, the music in the way that John did. What also made it just that little bit different when you think that in the early then, the early 1970s, when you got the big sort of metal bands arriving, the ones that were really interesting had some kind of other influence about them. English folk music fed into Led Zeppelin, but the same with Jeth Jess Rotel. You know, you've got Ian with his flute, and, and uh, Ian had a sense of classical music uh, at the time as well. And so did John. And so Led Zeppelin, Jess Rotel, Deep Purple, they bought something different. John bringing his classical sensitivity and sensibility into the mix for Deep Purple gave Purple just that different, I don't know, just elevated them in some way to a, a, a slightly different level. And, and to me, that's what John brought into the group. Kid, you know, and I was just like, God, what's that? You know, Steve Purple in rock, and that that started me off down the down the slippery slope. You know, it really did. And John was as a as a musician. I mean, as a keyboard player, um, what he did with a Hammond, you know, was was extraordinary. And there was Keith Emerson, Emerson Lake Apartment. He was much more sort of cerebral about stuff. Um, and there was Ken Hensley from from Uriah Heep, who did things with Hammond, but John was just more bluesy and but rocky at the same time. It was just, it just had this soulful feel to it. Um, it was really rhythmical and you see what he must have done to his hands over the years, bashing the keyboards like that. The great thing about John was his Hammond playing. It was unique, but John forged an identity uh, on the Hammond and, you know, the, the result of, the, of that was that Deep Purple forged a unique identity as well and I think he played an enormous part in inventing uh, the musical language, you know, that became synonymous with Deep Purple. The idea was to put a couple of new songs in which uh, were emotionally, uh, to us, connected to John. Uh, Uncommon Man was one, uh, just because of the way it was constructed. It was something, the way it starts was something that Steve and John started doing many years ago as an intro to another song. Just bouncing off uh, some, some chords where Steve would vamp around them and find a melody and it would inexplicably find its way into a tune. And so we used that same concept. So John was very much part of that. Uh, and the other one, Above and Beyond, although it didn't start out being in any way about or for John, the lyrics sort of made it that, you know, as if somebody was looking down. If somebody, if you need you, need me, I'll be back you know, in your emotions. So when the song was completed and the lyrics were all done, it sort of had this almost spiritual, ethereal uh, subtext to the lyrics. You know, that there was some, some sort of presence over, overseeing it. Everything is really um, 
natural and easy and even you know to the extent of getting Deep Purple to alter their arrangement slightly to you know to work with some of the ideas that we've got in the especially with um, Above and Beyond. That arrangement I I took a little bit of a sort of harmonics that Steve plays at the end of the song and I put it onto violin harmonics and combined it with a celesta and a harp and made this sort of slightly celestial sound. And all the way through the song, it keeps coming back as if it's kind of little presence of, of John. And without being pretentious about it, I just wanted to find ways to suggest the feeling that he's still here, he's still with us. It feels very much like it today, I have to say. experiences with John, good friend. I always felt like somehow he'd illuminated my life in some way that no other person had. A fount of wisdom and uh, just, you can't say enough good things about John. He's a lovely, lovely man. My first view of John was when he and Richie came to see an episode six gig with a view to looking at Ian Gillen. And uh, I didn't meet him or Richie that night, but I didn't like the look of him. A few days later when Ian Gillen had decided to join and asked me to go up and meet John to play some of our songs, I couldn't have been more surprised because who opened the door was this wonderful, lovely, intelligent, witty, urbane man, one of the nicest men I've ever met. And wow, what a change, what a change. Barely three, five, six gigs later, we're doing the Albert Hall for an orchestra. I mean, imagine that. We've got, uh, in fact, it was uncanny walking in here. We played here a few times, but you never forget the first time. And they had us doing a photograph session over there somewhere for the uh, concerto album we sat in there. Took us back to uh, many great memories of that particular venue. Uh, obviously focused around John and his concerto in the early days and many times since then. But that was the, that was the first memory. And uh, I could feel him there that night. I think everyone else could too. It was a wonderful evening, a celebration. There had been, you may have read at the time, a little bit of antipathy on both sides towards the project. And uh, so, uh, but here we were uh, about to do it. And uh, John said to me very quietly over, a glass of wine, he said, Ian, he said, oh, I wonder how you, have you given any thought to the lyrics for the second movement? <laughs> I said, well, as you know, John, I was going to sort of improvise, um, but uh, I've thought better of it, and so I've scribbled a few notes down on this napkin, and, uh, which I put in my pocket. And as we came to the second movement, I moved across, and John looked at me with a sort of worried look in his face, and I pulled the napkin out of my pocket and put it on the rostrum, and he looked across and he went. <laughs> and that was the way it went. Well, I, I think it's, it's, it's strange. I mean, you've got... Hi, Bob. You see, Bob Harris. Now, for goodness sake, laughing Bob Harris. Uh, come here. You've probably done all this, Bob, but that's just very nice to see you. It's very nice to see you. Are you, going to, be, are you going to be playing, talking, or what? I'm going to be talking. Excellent. Rambling in consequence. Wonderful voice. You're going to yes. be emceeing. Yes, I am. Thank God for that. Yeah. Good. And it looks like a good, a good lineup, isn't it? It looks beautiful, doesn't it? I mean, I've just been out on the stage, the yeah. orchestra there. This is what the Royal Albert Hall was made for. Absolutely. Yes. So. Absolutely. Well, I'm really, I'm really looking forward to it. Of course, we're in the Albert Hall, and that is not just a difference of space, but a difference of atmosphere, a difference of mental attitude, a whole kind of transformation of everything that we've been doing so far. This place, as I say, it's so special. It does infuse you with not just the occasion of being here, but everything else that's happened here. You know, the music is pouring down the walls, you know, and seeping into our, 
into our nervous system in this building. For us, it's a, it's a, it's a great thing to do because John was, I mean, but for me, John was part of my whole adult life. Uh, for Vicky, uh, I think she's had personal closure. I think this is a musical way of doing a very similar thing and saying bye-bye in a, in a fantastic way. Uh, eventually you have to say bye-bye and move on. But I think this is a rather correct way to do it. When I was told about it, I, I thought, oh God, it's very ambitious, you know, I hope, I hope it works. God, did it ever work. I've never heard uh, an audience so for the bands and for the musicians. And, you know, memories of when Glenn Hughes came on to, to a standing ovation that uh, brought him to tears. And hearing some, some of the music I'd, I'd never heard, um, a piece called Bure, how come I'd missed out on that? Absolutely magnificent. And at the end, when we all took a bow, I, I remember looking up and thinking, well, I'll, I'll never be part of some and some magnificent as this again in my life. It was a wonderful tribute to him. It was a privilege for me to be part of it, I must say. Uh, it was one of the greatest things I've ever been part of. That's all I can say about it. Hey, it was good. It's nervy. It's always nervy for a rock and roll musician to be playing dogs, even if we've learned with dogs, you know. It's, it's an uncomfortable place sometimes, and marrying it with an orchestra, like I said earlier, sometimes it's uh, it's a difficult marriage. But this went really well, I thought. Absolutely amazing. Um, it's really warming, and I think um, the audience is quite. They're very connected with the whole night, you know. So it's just not about music, but everybody's really kind of in touch and celebrating what about you know John's life. You know? It's a pretty unique show um, because everybody in the audience was there for the same reason. Yeah, they weren't, it wasn't, you know, a John Lord fan, an Ian Pace fan, a Paul Weller fan. And it, it wasn't like that. Everybody come to honour and to remember and to have a wonderful evening enjoying the music. Uh, so it was, it was like a glorified house party. Everybody was there to have a really good time and for the same reason. There were no other secondary reasons for being there. And as such, everybody in that room was a friend. They were all there with a common cause. Be relieved. Yeah, because there's lots of pressure. You don't want to let anyone down. Everyone is doing their very best. And you want them, you know, you want to ride with them. It's a, it's a lot of love, and it sounds again hippy as hell, but it's, it seems a lot of love coming from the audience, which is, which is fabulous, it's fabulous. And the song 
that I performed was a song that I wrote with John and it's never been heard before. So, you know, for people to hear something for the first time, it's always interesting. And for us to perform it for the first time is always an interesting thing. So, and I think the reaction that people give something on the first airing kind of carries with it, you know, kind of as a resonance somehow and we'll carry on with it. But I think I'd have John proud. I think he'd, he'd be happy. It's been really moving. Um, playing with an orchestra has been just, it's always been one of those things that you dream, you know, and you hope to do in your career. And it's one of those dreams come true. I've, I've played with quite a few, but these guys are amazing. So it's great. Amazing all round. It's such a lovely building, you go out and you, People are really close. They're actually closer than you think they are at the rock and roll gig. So you've got faces here. And it's, it's nice. It's, it makes it intimate in a way. I found myself calming down once I got on stage because the audience very much feels like they're, they're with us. It's a lovely feeling, actually. Yeah. I was able to sit in the box, in a audience box, on the on the side, but see and hear the whole first half of the show, which was basically just John's composition. It, just, it blew me away. Roger and I were sitting there, and it be, became very emotional. But hearing the lyrics of, of some of the things he'd written, and, and knowing him, and then hearing them played by people that had such admiration and reverence for him in front of an audience that had felt the same way. After he's gone, boy, that was, that was just about too much. If, when you hear that, if you're not moved, you got some distractions going on. The love and the respect that everyone there had for John showed up that night. It was obvious, it was plain, and a, a very fitting night. Uh, not to say goodbye to John, but to celebrate what he left us. That's what will make him immortal. to celebrate someone that we love, not only as the people that have come to work here and the crew and everyone and you guys and the audience in this building, but the people that are going to see this on film. Um, like I said, just on stage, we can choose happiness or choose whatever we want to. And uh, one of the things that John taught me when I was, he's a little older than I was, so you know, he taught me a lot of things I didn't hear back then, but now coming back to me, so choose happiness. Live life to the fullest extremity that you can of love. Yeah, I'm a 60s child, so I can talk about that, but um, it's really, really great to be here. 
Well, he's there. He's there in the music, he's there in our thoughts. And uh, it's all you can hope for. It's what tonight's about. <laughs> I know John really loved what we did for him on that night. He was really, really happy. And to be able to put that celebration together for him makes me feel complete. More in a way, he's still missed terribly, but it makes me feel happy and we need to move on and, and just remember how lucky we are that John was who he was and all this beautiful music that will remind us of him and he'll never go away, all his beautiful music's there and it's just try not to cry every time you listen to it but I suppose there'll be times you know, we can listen to it and feel happier. <laughs>